Excellent. All right, hello and good luck. Um, and with that, we'll get the show on the road. I will share this game link um, and said no jokes channel, just so he knows where I'm at. And once I've done that, we'll start the game. Okay. Here we go. E4. Um, I'm going to stick with my standard reply. E5. So this is going to get exciting. <coughs> And by that, I mean, um, I did not expect a Ruy Lopez, and we are going to play um, the one line of the Ruy Lopez that I've studied the most, which is the Berlin defense. So hopefully we'll get an interesting game out of this. Um, Black's idea is that he's going to push his four on three advantage on the queen side while simultaneously hindering a king side advance from white. Um, I'm trying to remember there's all kinds of ways that black could choose to play this. Um, and I'm struggling to remember what is a normal response to h3. What comes to mind are bishop e7, um, bishop e6, and bishop e7, um, as well as h6, discouraging bishop g5. Um, oh, b6 is also a possibility. I'm going to stick with b6. It's been old faithful in tries past, and it just may work for me today. So one idea behind this setup is to play the king there. The bishop on e6. Um, and um, just advance on the queen side as planned. Something's not entirely right about my user style, so this name is appearing in purple instead of the normal color. Um, I'll endeavor to correct that for the next time I play. Okay, so it's pretty typical in this opening for black to drop his knight onto g6, where it attacks the square, and um, thus makes it difficult for the bishop to land there. Uh, one thing I do have to be concerned about is a potential attack on f7. Namely, knight g5 to f7 may be something to be concerned about. Um, but in general, this idea of g4 is really weakening um, because black has this potential to play h5 and simultaneously harass uh, the pawn chain because if pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn. Um, but also, uh, even if white trades down, h3 is still a target. And if white doesn't trade down, um, well, okay. I guess time will tell how this plays out. b6 in itself is trying to commit to this idea of get, tucking the king over on b7. However, I'm not sure what to do about this attack on f7. I could do bishop e6 and then hide my king away. Um, I have a feeling that he's just going to pawn storm me on the king side. <clears throat> on the king side, if I attempt that, 
and so maybe I am forced to play King E8. Um, thus having squandered a move on B6. Um, so King, the choice here is really do I play King E8 or Bishop E6? Um, Bishop E6 really admits that this attack on the king side is going nowhere. Uh, I think King E8 is kind of uh, compelled here. At any rate, I'm most curious about what happens in this line, and I'm not as curious about bishop e6, because bishop e6 is just conceding that black has messed up. And I'm not interested in conceding at this point. I really want to know what's going to happen if I just go for it. Alright, so... Um, if I play h5, probably f5 happens, and I'm sad. Um, so I'm tempted to play uh, knight g6, applying some pressure on e5, probably forcing uh, some knight move either to f3 or e4, uh, and then play h5. Hey, wait a second, what's going to defend this pawn? Like, if I go h5, he plays f5, I take, he takes back, I play rook h4, maybe he does rook f4, I don't know, but this king side looks extremely airy. Again, out of just sheer curiosity, I push forward. This is going to be a free lesson for me. I'm not too proud to admit that. Um, the alternative was knight g6, trying to add more pressure on the center and a more gradual push on this side, but I'm really pessimistic about that. Okay, so, I mean, maybe he does rook f4 to defend if I play rook h4. Um, In which case, I just take f5. This is what I calculated earlier. I mean, I saw the possibility to sack on f5, and I saw a possibility of playing rook h4. It took me an, a grand eternity to add 2 and 2 together there, but it looks like I'm winning a pawn. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this king side's collapsing. And meanwhile, all my pieces and all his pieces are just sitting on the back row. Um, so do I do bishop takes? Wait, no. This this isn't a pin. Um, okay. That That's why I wasn't adding two and two together, because that doesn't work. Um, this bishop protects the rook. So unless I have some really awesome tactic somewhere, um, taking an f5 just loses the rook. So uh, what do I do? What do I do? I'm very tempted to play knight d5, bishop c5, um, and just see how quickly my pieces develop and see if there's any shot to take on f5 after any of this. Uh, it's really tempting. Also tempting is f6. Uh, I guess he just moves his knight. That's not so tempting. Um, if I had a spare tempo, I'd play c5 and bishop b7 all at once, threatening rook h1. Uh, I, I mean, I guess against that he could play knight f3, even if that were legal. Uh, he could play knight f3 and limit his losses to just a pawn. Yeah, no, we're just gonna go all in here. I'm calling the bluff. Another possibility was knight g6. Um, 
We could take there, I would take on g4, and I'm probably losing, but maybe it wouldn't have hurt to calculate that sort of thing. Um, but as the rook moves off the square, I mean, where is it going? I'm certainly intending this. I don't have a concrete follow-up just yet, but uh, just having two pieces attack this particular square gives me some confidence that I might have something there. Um, maybe I don't. It's an interesting position for sure. Oh, I suppose once my... I could even consider king f8 getting this bishop developed to say d7 or something and rook e8. It's just a really unusual way to develop in this opening. Um, but if it works, it works, right? So the downside of bishop c5 is they encourages king g2 um, and king g3. It's not something I want to uh, see this game. Um, I mean, he might do that regardless of where I put my pieces, but if I develop them accurately, like bishop e7 hitting this, um, then maybe I have shots to play bishop takes f5. Oh, what a complicated position. Uh, wait, now if the king goes up to g3, though, I've got rook h1. I'm set there. So there's nothing to fear there, but bishop, G, bishop e7 might be more opportunistic since the knight's stuck defending the rook. Um, something that gets the knight to move, uh, or takes the knight, would allow me to take on f5. Yeah, I'm not seeing... Um, well, I guess, no, if I do bishop e7, he does knight c3. I could trade on c3, trade on g5. Uh, there's no tactical sequence that works, though. Um, hmm. It's problematic. I could play g6. Um, uh, threatening to really shatter these pawns here. It also keeps my options open. G6, he's probably intending E6. I could throw in this move, this check at any time, so why play it now? And with G6, I'm threatening to take F5 twice. And if he takes there, uh, I do pawn takes. And then I'm still threatening to take G4. There's still no way to defend it. Um... So these bishop moves are tempting, but they don't force anything. This g6 is un, very unclear, very uncomfortable. Um, but it might be the way to go. Rarely is the most comfortable move also the best move. Um, Yeah, so what's wrong with g6? It looks very right. Um, yeah, it looks like white is completely overextended. I'm not understanding this position. We're going to play this. Um, so if he plays like knight f3, I can do pawn takes and I'm hitting the rook. So I'm really not afraid of losing this rook. Um, I guess worst case, uh, maybe he takes on g6 first, I take back, 
and maybe things get complicated somehow. I'm not sure how. Uh, but it really looks like he's overextended himself. He's developed a knight and a rook. I've developed a rook and a knight. Um, and I'm really looking to activate my bishops while his king is so exposed. And while I'm attacking the base of his pawn chain. He hasn't really found a weakness on my side of the board just yet. He's very close, but he hasn't found one yet. Um, so... I think I've at least equalized here. I hesitate to say such things because I'm just setting myself up and jinxing it, but... Um, and earlier I was claiming that this game would be a lesson for me, and now I'm not so sure. I guess the move I was most afraid of earlier was just e6. Um, I take f5. Oh, that's why I hesitated to play g6, is because of e6. But no, I just push f6. He's got a passed pawn. But tactically, I think things um, justify my going into this variation. Namely, e6, f6. I don't see what he can do other than knight f7 or knight f3. Um, in either case, I just take f5. His development's just one move too slow, and his rook is exposed on e5 and tied down by this pin. Um, so I'm not sure where he's going. This is definitely a focal point, as is this. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe that's possible. Oh, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no, he, if I were to check him, he would just move his king forward. He wants to move his king as close to these pawns as possible, and he doesn't want to lose to such tactics. All right, so I'm just going to play what I calculated. Um... I know it's often a good strategy to double-check your moves before you play them, but I've been calculating that for multiple minutes leading up to this position, and I don't think I've missed anything, and I don't think any additional calculation on this is going to yield anything, so I'm just playing it. Um, I think Rook E4 was possibly mistaken, though. Where else would he put the Rook? I don't know. I didn't really have anywhere to put it. I like this game. This is interesting. It's possible I might be playing a good chess game. I mean, we can laugh at the idea, because often I deviate from book very heavily and get punished for it. Um, and by book, I mean just established theory of what's known to be good, uh, what's known to have worked in the past, and just well-recognized patterns. For sure, I've deviated from... Well, I can't say for sure, but I'm almost certain that this position's never been seen before on a chessboard. Um, I could be wrong, maybe it has, but um, I do think that this line is very forcing, and as such it must be theoretical, either from a standpoint of somehow white is doing well here, somehow white's doing okay here, or the more likely possibility um, at least as it seems to me right now, that black's got an advantage. Um, I guess one thing I keep fixating on, uh, yeah, is this material grab. And I hadn't even considered the possibility that my opponent might also try to grab material. Um, 
so that's where things get touchy. Like, if I move the bishop away now, there might be possibilities of him just taking and running. So I don't necessarily want to run my bishop out here checking him, especially bringing his king closer to my rook. Um, I could just take f5. I mean, f5's hanging-ish. What's going on? If I take f5... He takes f5, um, I check, he moves the king, we trade on e4 I suppose, and he's got a passed pawn on e6. I don't like that at all. Um, also possible is knight e7, but if I'm going to play knight e7 I want to check first, but again I can't check because that brings his king too close to my rook. Uh, tactics just don't favor me there. So I have to leave the bishop on f8, if I'm trying to grab material anyway. And this material grab puts his bishop on g5, and it's frightening. It really is. Um, huh. I mean, I could move my knight all the way out to b4. On b4, I'm threatening to do this, which it's not going to work because he just plays knight c3 and he's escaped with tempo. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is getting really murky. A comfortable thing to do is trade on f5, then trade on e4. But because it's comfortable, it's almost guaranteed to be wrong. Um, if I take g5, he gets all these passed pawns, which is almost also certainly wrong. Uh, could play bishop h6. Just pin the knight. I could play knight f3 in response. And all heck breaks loose. I'm probably losing a bishop there if I'm calculating right. Um, okay, well, I'll need to look at this. Pawn takes, bishop takes, pawn takes f5. I'm attacking the rook. He could take my rook, I take his rook, he takes, I take. And now we've got pawns on g4 and e6. And he's got no way to defend the e6 pawn other than pushing where my bishop's already attacking that square, so that doesn't really defend it. So I'm looking at takes, takes g5, takes, and just all our pieces getting exchanged in this big bloodbath, um, but I'm not seeing how I lose material here. Uh, I could take g5, he takes d5 instead. I take f5, his pawn's pinned again. Yeah, I'm just not getting this. We're going to go into it, as I've been doing the entire game. We're just going to play the most forcing variation and see what happens with extreme force. So he's got some candidate moves. He's got this, he's got that. That probably, I mean, that loses a pawn. He's got taking here. Um, I'm not sure if he's got anything else. Maybe something completely out of the ordinary, like knight c3 or knight d2 or something completely insane looking like that might work here. Some incredible positions look. It's an in-between move that causes the evaluation of the entire position to change might be possible here. But no, I'm, I'm mainly focused on this possibility where I get to take on f5. And if he takes on g6, I mean, this is a candidate move, but I think it's refuted by knight f4. I think he's just completely overextended. And I'm not sure how he's going to try to dig himself out of this.
Yeah, uh, we're all curious where this is going to go. And I'll just take this opportunity to remind people, and I appreciate this, um, that I'm going to attempt to play this without assistance. And so it's really tempting to chime in and think, like, what your best move in this position was. Um, but if everybody starts talking about, like, what white's gonna do what black's gonna do unfortunately that puts me in the position where i can no longer read along as people are talking and it's kind of sad but um so that unfortunately puts us in a position where i can talk about this game and uh, my viewership cannot at least until it ends um with those just tuning in, here's how we got to this position. Um, so this is a pretty standard opening to Ray Lopez. It's been played a million sometimes. Um, I play a variation called the Berlin Defense. I'm not sure why it's got that name. I don't know enough about chess history, but I do understand that uh, queens get traded in this opening as does white trading a bishop for a knight on c6. And so we get this really interesting wall of pawns here that um, that takes a long, long time to advance on the queen side. And white has a four on three advantage on the queen king side. And so white's big idea is to try to um, attack on the king side and push this through and either checkmate black, win heavy material, or get a passed pawn. And Black's idea is to try to uh, advance this four on three on the queen side in some hopes of getting forming some sort of distraction and being able to form an attack on White's overextended king side. Um, I'm a little confused by this knight g5, king e8, because this is super hyper aggressive by White. And I didn't back down. I played h5. And I, I thought that White's just simply overextended here. Um, but he extends further. And so from, this, from that standpoint, I think that this line or this game is theoretical. Um, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it, I'm not sure what's going on, but... If white just had one extra tempo to secure some of this stuff, then this would be great for white. But here we are. Uh, so my last move was taking his knight. He's returned the favor by taking my knight. Um, I admit, I didn't calculate this. Well, I mean, I, I got this. I saw bishop takes, and I thought I was just doing rook takes g4, right? Rook takes g4. Um, white's center is collapsing. Black is temporarily up a pawn and has the bishop pair. Um, I'm really not seeing an alternative. I mean, I could do pawn takes rook, he does bishop takes, and then I don't have the extra pawn, but it... Actually, wait, no, I... S <laughs> uh, it really depends how you evaluate these things, right? So if I take rook takes g4, rook takes pawn takes... My pawn on g4 is kind of a goner, right? Or isn't it? Um, no, I think it is. I'm pretty sure it is. But if I take e4, he does bishop takes there, and then I do pawn takes d5, and I'm attacking this and threatening... Yeah, I mean, that looks very strong. So let's see that over the board. So now he's got two separated kingside pawns. I didn't immediately... Actually, I did win a pawn. I didn't even cal count correctly. I did calculate correctly. I didn't count. Um, so now I've got a five on two advantage on the queen side, and I'm threatening to win another pawn. So this is looking pretty good for black. Not gonna lie. I would not be surprised if my opponent took this opportunity to resign. Now, I haven't moved any of my three remaining pieces off the back row, so maybe he won't. Maybe he'll play on. 
maybe I'm talking out of both sides sides of my mouth here. Um, but I really like this position for black. Yeah, this, I mean, White's best chances here lie with him getting active pieces before I activate mine. And I just don't see an obvious weakness. Um, so I want to take on e6, defending d5. Uh, so this is candidate move one, candidate move two. And there's always bishop c5 check, but I don't want to play that. But maybe that's called for, I don't know. Um, I think regardless, I think they all transpose. If I just push a pawn, I'm wasting time. Uh, bishop e6 develops my bishop. But my bishop might actually be better placed on b7. Uh, <laughs> except for the fact that it would have three pawns in front of it. It would be really well placed there. Uh, taking there allows me to attack g4, and I haven't yet committed to c6 or possibly c5. Um, wait, All right, no, so he's attacking d5, I do need to do something about that. I was going to say, otherwise I could just like do bishop e7 and try to activate somehow, but uh, no, I have to get my pieces active. Um, Oh, look at that. I was considering bishop e6, knight b5, c6, and no problems other than knight c7 winning a piece. Other than that, it's great. Um, yeah. Let's not do that. c6 is tempting because this pawn on c6 is really far out of white's reach, and it cuts off the knight's access to b5. Um... I think he plays rook c1, and I'm not sure how I follow. You know, I'm spending a ton of time evaluating the various ways this can go. c6 looks strong, bishop e6 looks strong, they're both good. I'm not... I keep calculating and not seeing any refutation to either of these. If I do c6, he just does knight e2 and then rook c1. So I haven't gained anything there. Um, Bishop e6 it is, and then if knight b5, king d7, and then if rook c1, uh, c6, and then if knight d4, well, I can actually pin the knight, and then trade down and then take on g4, um, more likely I pin the knight, and then he unpins it by blocking with his bishop and I just take g4. And as long as that knight on d4 can't check my king on d7, which it cannot, um, I'm set here. So the one thing I want to avoid is an opposite color bishop endgame. I mean, here I'm already up two pawns. I might get up a third very soon. But that kind of endgame is something to avoid in general. Maybe I cannot avoid it. Um, no, I was not afraid of this move. I could even play bishop c5 here. Um, then he plays b4 later. So let's not go there. Um, yeah, let's play the line I calculated, which is knight d4, bishop c5, bishop f2, and then after bishop f2 I just take g4. And everything's still all pinned up and whatnot. Oh, okay. Uh, that's possible too. But this bishop's kind of exposed here. Um, okay, he's threatening knight. No, he's not. Knight can't move. Um, get sack on c5 and then move the knight, but he's not going to do that. So we're going to trade rook for two, or at least threaten to trade rook for two. 
simultaneously getting the rook out of the corner. And I, if I take f6, he takes c5. I take c5, he takes e6. Everything takes everything, and I'm winning the pawn endgame, and that's all that really matters. Okay, so I have no rook. All I've got are a million pawns. Um, three... Well, I'm going to have three passed pawns versus a rook. Um, practically speaking, this is very strong for black. So just drop my bishop back here. Okay, so it's not so easy for me to actually get the bishop back there because I missed rook h7 check. Um, that complicates things. I could still push c4 and then push my c pawn, and I've got tons of passed pawns. This isn't how I want things to go. I might not be able to change it now, but. Um, it's the other, yeah, no, I, uh, I miscalculated. So I am giving back a pawn. Still, we must march forward. We must march onward and find a way to win this. Three connected past pawns is probably worth a pawn. Um, did I say three connected past pawns? I meant three connected past pawns plus a centralized king. I might even end up sacking this pawn. Wouldn't that be wild? No. Um, so the square is covered by my bishop. I'm threatening b4 and d3 and all this. Uh, all that jazz. I could also play bishop takes. He takes b5. He's got some passed pawns of his own for me to worry about. I could also play e3 here, uh, kind of forcing king f1. One thing for me to watch out for um, is his possibility of getting a passed pawn. So time spent on b4 accelerates his own plans. Uh, I think I think tactically this works. So this threat I think compels king f1, which he does not want to play here. Um he doesn't want to play that because that means I get to promote with check. Or make promotion threats, uh, and those threats uh, come with check. So yeah, three pawns on the sixth rank, pretty good. Big idea is e2, king moves. I could also do bishop h3. Uh, I think they're both winning. Uh, 
And so now I promote. Actually, if king e1, I just do this. And it's even more devastating than you can imagine. So, um, I'm not sure how he's going to stop the threat. Good game, well played, very interesting. Um, so yeah, let's go over that, Ken. That was really cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he was sure that he was winning out of the opening, is what he said there, right before I switched into this mode. Uh, so throughout the game, I muttered my thoughts as I went along. Um, is there a way I can request a computer analysis on this game? Yeah, I feel dumb asking that. Those of you who've been here know why. Um, yeah, good game. I really enjoyed it. So I thought that this, this G4 was just overly aggressive. Um, Stockfish kind of favors my position there, whatever. Okay, so let's gratify myself for a moment and see just what Stockfish thought of my performance. One mistake. Other than that, a good game. C5 is a mistake. Um, apparently D4 is better. Oh yeah! Yeah, no, just D4, bishop there, and push the pawns, push the pawns. I mean, there's no weaknesses. The way I played it was a bit risky, uh, but we'll go back to the top and play this out. So yeah, this is your typical Berlin defense, uh, your starting position. Common moves here are rook d1, bishop g5, knight g5, b3, h3, um, maybe even knight c3, and possibly other moves are also typical. Um, so he played h3, which I think is fine b6, I'm using the fact that he hasn't moved a piece as an opportunity for me to move one of my own pieces. Or, I'm sorry, one of my own pawns. Um, just give Since he gave me the time to do it, and his development's kind of slow other than his kingside push, I'm slowly mobilizing on the queen side, trying to not make any weaknesses. Generally, I tend to get blown out of the game pretty badly when I play this opening. Uh, I just get crushed in the center. Um, or get, generally I tend to make a lot of pawn weaknesses, and then as white has more space, it's easier for white to press, push an attack. It's really very difficult, especially in a 15-10 time control, um, for black to try to play actively and to neutralize white's uh, constant pressure. So that, that's why I played b6, is because I'm playing a little more um, uh, cowardly. That's the word. I'm trying not to make any pawn weaknesses. Um, oh, do I have an uh, audio countdown for the clock? No, but I think Leechess does have an in built in audio countdown. Um, I think that's only if you're playing with a certain sound theme. Anyhow. Um, he plays knight g5, so he's kind of mixed a few ideas here. So one idea is normally just play knight g5, knight e4, get your other pieces out, and use the knight on e4 kind of as a lever to force black to move some pawns and weaken himself. Here I played a really slow move, king e8. Um, basically saying, you know, white's spent, out of this time that we've got out of the opening phase. He's developed one piece, I've developed one piece. I'm really not afraid of what he's throwing at me. Or at least that's what I'm kind of claiming by playing this way. I'm just saying, um, you know, if you've got something, show me. Um, it's b6 and king e8 uh, and knight e7. It's just slow. Um, but I think Given White's lack of development and how far he is from connecting these rooks, 
Uh, he's two turns away from that. Then even if he does connect the rooks, it's going to take him some more tempi to secure all the stuff he's pushed on the king's side. Uh, I think black's fine. He played f4. So, yeah. As Stockfish points out, I was kind of expecting, and I didn't say this aloud until later, didn't dawn on me just how bad this was until later I saw that white doesn't have time for king g2 and king g3. And so the whole game, this g4 pawn was hanging. Um, uh, so, yeah, just to give an idea of how this normally-ish would go, black does play knight g6. He does want to develop his bishop. He's not sure where this bishop's going to go. And part of where this bishop goes is a function of where that knight ends up. Um, he doesn't want to allow knight takes bishop, because uh, this pawn formation of 2, 1, and 4 is just disastrous for black. So that's why he's focused on getting this bishop out instead. Um, so yeah, h6, I would argue probably knight e4, but whatever. Stockfish likes this, maybe because of this weakness, maybe because it solidifies e5. And black takes a shot at this. He wants to develop the rook, then the bishop. Yeah, normally <laughs> this is one of those openings where black like develops the rook, then the bishop, then the rook, and then, you know, maybe he thinks about developing this bishop on c8. Uh, it's not unlike a king's Indian in that regard. Uh, yeah, Stockfish has no idea. I mean, maybe it does, but I'm just gonna claim that no human would ever play this way, and uh, it might be okay, but why would you do it that way? There must be some tactical justification for this monstrosity, but um, I don't know. I'm just not buying it, Stockfish. Okay, I mean, the bishop on b7 looks beautiful in light of the fact that white's done this really weird thing on the king's side and this looks awesome and somehow white doesn't have the one knight here and the other knight there protecting it um so i guess bishop b7 makes sense in that regard and like i was saying earlier probably just knight e4 here get the other knight out take the e4 square use it to do bug house like tactics over here especially because black's king's in the center. Anyway, I, I'm rambling. Let's see, what have I missed? Um, so, h5, f5. Um, yeah, white's just doubling down, but, I mean, what else can he do at this point? And he's just losing the pawn. And losing the pawn by itself isn't so bad. Um, and I did play this very exactly this is very strong play on my part um, and e6 really i mean okay i need to break this down this is like the critical position of the game i was saying correctly that i'm winning a pawn but i, I didn't go so far as to claim that like oh black's completely totally winning the game and such I really liked Black's position, but um, White has a lot to fight for, even down upon. And Stockfish points out, you just take g6, I take back, and just develop the rest of your pieces and play a normal chess game. Okay, I won a pawn, but there's a long game ahead of us still. Uh, thanks for the offer. Let me finish analyzing this game first. Um, Bishop d2, bishop c5, okay, and, um, yeah, I mean, white activates his king, and it's a long, difficult fight ahead. Um, here, white's played e6, and I played f6, and this is brilliant, just because the tactics work in black's favor. Uh, there's this knight f3, uh, after which I just take f5. So. Oh yeah, and during the game I was commenting, uh, well, maybe white just sacks a 
I don't even know how little or how much he's sacking here. He's got three disconnected pawns. Um, I wasn't sure what would go on if this happened. Looks like the rook's hanging. Stockfish doesn't like the idea of me sacking in exchange, nor doesn't like bishop c5 check. It instead recommends, I guess, just this and that and try to mow this down. Uh, oh, so this threatens to take there and push e7 and it looks complicated. Um, I was looking for some way to trade off bishops and trade off pieces in general. Um, oh, that's not good. That's not good for white. Um, this is bishop h6 forces white to move the bishop away. I guess maybe there. And you check and you just take the bishop with the rook. So, uh, backing up, rook h8 threatens bishop h6, which looks crushing. Um, yeah, white's development. <laughs> Just look at that. Black's one knight that he's developed. Uh, after this knight c3, black is better developed than white is, despite black having rook, bishop, bishop, rook on the back row. Um, so yeah, I think that's the critical part of the game. Um, let's see, what else is there? So I guess we just gonna look at how the game did end up continuing. Um, I correctly calculated some tactics. Go me. Uh, bishop takes e6 is good. So c6 would have been a wasted tempo. Like, as I was pointing out, White would just double back with knight e2, rook c1, and c6 would look kind of clumsy. Or maybe do rook uh, d1 instead, but uh, c6 would be a wasted move. And taking an e6 is better, because now I have a threat here. In fact, if I had done c6, probably White just plays king g2. And then, as has been foretold and prophesied so many times... Now the king finally gets to defend the pawn, and white's not down three pawns anymore, but just down two. Uh, so that's why taking e6 is so important. White doubles down in desperation, as he should. Uh, you don't get points for just hanging in there the longest. You have to try to secure a draw or secure a win if you can. Um, and then... Rook c1, c6, I pin the knight, yeah, I, I was surprised by this, I was expecting bishop f2, after which, I mean, yeah, he's doubly pinned and he doesn't like that, um, oh, I had better, I should have just taken g4 like I originally planned, is this really better, so like, what if he does that, what do I do? Apparently, Stockfish likes this instead, threatening to play b4. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm so confused. Why would black allow that? Huh. Um, I'm not understanding any of this. I'm thinking that Stockfish just likes showing off fancy moves at this point. Um... Why would white take there? I guess he would take there because he doesn't want black to get, like, three connected past pawns. So he's willing to uh, sack an exchange to attempt to stop that or something. I'm mean, just... This is way beyond me. I, I don't understand why white would give up an exchange here. Um, there must be some tactic. Some extremely wonky tactic that forces that. Actually, we have got local analysis. Um, let's use it. Um, let's say if I were white, what would I play other than taking? How would I endeavor to lose this game as white? I mean, I, I don't want to trap my rook there, so... 
What if I did night takes? All right, Starfish. Or whatever your engine is. Yeah, show me what I did wrong. Suppose I need to enable arrows or something. Yeah, computer arrows. Rook C8. Oh. Okay, right. So, so you can't... I mean... Okay, what if I defend my rook and then threaten to take it? Okay, that loses some material somehow, I bet. Yeah, I'm allowing white to advance, uh, black to advance with tempo. <laughs> okay, what if this? Okay, I attack. Hit the rook. And attack here. We trade. And I guess, again, black's got the bishop here and three connected past pawns, and it's just amazing. Oh, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. So the point of this whole rook c6 thing, which at first glance just gives away an exchange, the point is that now we've got opposite color bishops, and black doesn't have a bishop pair anymore. Um... So that's the deal. Let me turn off computer arrows. Okay, so we've got an endgame that white might have some remote chance of holding. And he sacked a rook for a bishop and a pawn um, to get this, but this is better than the endgame where black has the bishop pair and all these connected past pawns to just mow over white. It's pretty amazing. Um, that said, none of that occurred. I didn't just take on g4 like I'd intended to do earlier. Instead, I saw this flashy tactic. Um, after I saw it, I saw that, oh wait, he just plays bishop e5 and the tactic doesn't happen. But um, at this point, white's morale was just gone. So he played g5, I took on f6, he took back, I take here, I take there. And now, despite having a plus nine advantage, uh, basically meaning I'm going to get a queen. Um, it's not easy for black to win this. I mean, it does take some technique, and my technique was flawed. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even have to play the recommended d4. What I had to avoid, which is what happened in the game, was dividing up my pawns in ways that like, you see, now I've got this A pawn that's isolated from all the rest of these, and I'm pushing C4. And pawns just don't really support each other very well, or complement each other. Yeah, it only occurred to me after I played this possibility of King D6, with the idea of Bishop D8, Bishop uh, B6, I guess it still doesn't work. Um, Wait, wait a minute. So I played b5. I meant to say here this possibility of, oh, now I can't get the bishop over there. Well, uh, I imagine that there's some way to play this cautiously is what I'm trying to get at. Like I could play a5 and then get my bishop here and whatever and not hang any pawns. And I'm pretty much invincible in this fortress, um, which certainly would have sufficed. I have such an enormous advantage that that kind of shelter that doesn't drop pawns would have worked. Um, incidentally, the way I played it happened to work out a lot better, but I think part of that was just luck. Um, yeah, also this bishop e7 is not so bright because um, it yields the c3 square, and I might have needed that, as we see, saw in the game. Uh, it would have been useful in this instance to already have my bishop on f6, and frankly to have my king on e5 a tempo faster. So bishop e7 retreating was not a good move, um, but I had an, a large enough advantage that I was able to convert this anyway. Um, 
Yeah, at this point, white plays king f1. Um, I mean, technically, this loses faster than other alternatives, which, I mean, you could chase my bishop around, spend some time trying to promote some of his own pawns. Um, but, yeah, this e2 check is devastating. Uh, and the point is not so much king e1 uh, and this or even that pin. Um, but the point here is that even if king... Uh, obviously if the king moves away, the pawn just promotes. But this would be an attempt to keep the pawn, king near the pawn. And now the king can't um, defend this square any longer. Uh, I mean, the same applies if king there. I mean, this is more obvious and direct and such. Uh, I don't have on auto queen. How about that? Or maybe that doesn't apply in analysis mode. Um, but, yeah, if this sort of thing sometimes works in other positions. Like, if this were one file over and I'd had to, like, play it, well, I guess that would even work. Um, but, yeah, there are some positions where this king can't force the other king to move away. And sometimes you're able to attack this square without attacking f2. And in those cases, white might have a tempo to, like, later play rook c1 and slow this a little further. Um, but in this particular configuration, I was able to just force the king away from the pawn. Uh, and, yeah, I'm not surprised at all that white went for this uh, king f1 idea. It's really easy for black to mess it up. Um, and to hang a bishop or two and hang the pawns. I mean, like, if we did king f1 and I accidentally did this, I'm probably still winning. I'm curious, because, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm winning. There's no surprise there. Um, it's kind of funny. Anyhow, uh, yeah, that was an interesting game, an interesting end game, and I actually played an opening accurately for once. So a good game all around. Ah, you want to see like what would happen if I were to just uh, fortress up here? Like, how could this be converted if I just, rather than pushing for a promotion immediately, how would I manage to win that after that variation I suggested? Uh, it's a fair question. So, like, I played a5 here. I'm sure Stockfish will point out some... St uh, I have to turn st uh, computer arrows back on. I think this is what you're referring to. Like, how would I manage to advance this? I don't know. Actually, yeah, we have a challenge from Liberian. Uh, let's take on this challenge, and um, we'll leave the rest as an exercise for the viewer. Uh, so thanks for watching, and let's play this next game.